Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our lecturer for the Max Schmidt Heine lecture at this uh, symposium. But I think before doing so, I should pay tribute to the Max Schmidt Heine Foundation. Max Schmidt Heine was a very distinguished uh, Swiss entrepreneur, and the foundation which he set up over 25 years ago has really been of huge support to this conference. So many people who've uh, taken part in the conference have said, this conference is something special, something I said at the beginning yesterday morning. It is something special, but I believe it could never have been something special without the support of the Max Schmidt Heine Foundation. And therefore, I'd like to publicly acknowledge that. Our, uh, <laughs> thank you. Our lecturer is Robert Collymore, who is the group uh, chief executive officer of Safaricom, which he still says uh, is a small Kenyan mobile operator. I think that's not how the rest of the world sees it. Uh, it's done an enormous amount uh, in sub-Saharan Africa throughout emerging markets for the financially excluded and for the poor. And the M-Pesa system, uh, financial money settling system, uh, which has also huge uh, knock-on uh, services which come with it are really having a transforming effect uh, in emerging markets. And indeed, the strapline of Safaricom is transforming lives. Because of its vision of something more than profit, he has been uh, recognized, especially by the United Nations, where uh, the Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, uh, invited him to join the UN Global Compact Board. And in addition, he has been uh, a commissioner uh, on the UN Commission on Life-Saving Commodities for Women and Children. He's going to lecture. Then we're going to have uh, a relatively brief uh, Q&A. But please, ladies and gentlemen, will you give a very warm welcome for Robert Collymore? Thank you. And have a great lecture. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I asked him to be a little more modest than that. Um, for many of you, you don't know who Safaricom is, so just a couple of words. We are a, a, an East African mobile uh, operator in Kenya. Uh, we have around 20, 21 million customers, uh, 600,000 shareholders. And we've been around for about 14 years. Um, so, uh, the question that I ask myself, and you are probably asking yourself, is what is a small African company doing punching above their weight? Uh, what are we doing standing in front of such, frankly, an august audience as, um, as yours? Um, I want to spend the next 30 minutes or so uh, explaining why it is that we think we are standing on this stage. Um, why does it we think we stand on stages in, in Stockholm, in New York, in Washington? It is because we act with a purpose. If you ask many CEOs and business leaders, and indeed boards, what is their primary purpose? They will tell you it is to provide superior shareholder returns. Now, even for those CEOs in this room that subscribe to the triple bottom line, people, profit, and planets, the fact is that many are doing so for compliance rather than really feeling it in their heart. And it's, it's hardly surprising that that is the case. Most CEOs have a tenure of about four years. In the first year, they spend trying to f explain why it is that their predecessor made such a mess of the company. The second half of that first year, they bring their own lieutenants in to fill the C-suite. The second year, they start to explain the turnaround strategy. And by the time they get to the third and fourth year, they start to look for the exit route. Um, because they know that the alarm clock is about to go off and there's not a snooze button. If you layer on top of that, the need for annual or even quarterly reporting, 
you'll see that, that quarterly, for the tyranny of the quarterly reporting cycle means that the first quarter that you report bad results, the second quarter, the bad results are announced usually about two weeks before the board says that you have left to pursue personal interest. But that has to change, ladies and gentlemen. And which is why we at Safaricom have taken a different approach. And why is it changing? Because we have these guys. Some people call them the millennials. The millennials are different. Once upon a time, customers simply voted. And what I mean by voting, they either decided to buy your product or not buy the product. That's a very thin form of democracy. Today, this guy wants to participate in your product. He wants to help you to define the product and the experience that he's going to have. The second reason is that we have this thing called social media. Here are some numbers, and these numbers are alarming. You no longer have to wait until the 9 o'clock news to discover that your favorite brand has been engaged in child labor or has been accused of, in being in, of engaging in child labor. The, the response is immediate, and this is changing the way that corporates uh, have, to, have to conduct themselves. We have some examples of uh, citizen journalism. Here, we can see the impact that the so-called citizen journalist now has. You don't have to wait for the BBC. Um, once upon a time, corporates were able to manipulate the media. That is no longer the case. You cannot manipulate uh, social media. And of course, regulators are much less benign than they, they once were. <laughs> So at Safaricom, we decided a few years ago that we had to redefine what we did. And in redefining that, we came up with a strap line that said we want to transform lives. We had to move away from simply considering the shareholder. Incidentally, the shareholder is somebody whose the relationship with, with whom is much less deep than you think. Right now, my shareholders are making a decision minute by minute on whether to stay in this relationship or not. I didn't check my share price before I left, and I didn't check how many shares were, were uh, traded um, yesterday. But I bet you it would have been maybe 50 or 60 million shares. My relationship with the shareholder cannot be a deep one. However, I must respect, because I have, as I said at the beginning of this chat, I have 600,000 shareholders. So we decided, let us define our stakeholders. And our stakeholders we defined as being eight. The first, of course, were the customers, the most important of the stakeholders we have. The second were the shareholders, of course. Then we have employees, we have business partners, we have the media, we have regulators, and interestingly, we have society and we have future generations. So uh, what does transforming lives mean? This is a rural Kenyan. It's a typical Kenyan who lives in a village. Once upon a time, if she had sufficient money, she would educate her child, and the child would perhaps move to the city, and sometimes that would be the last time she'd see that child, because the city was a very long way away. Today, because we give them something called a mobile phone, she's now able to stay in touch with the child, and incidentally, she, the child can also send money back home using a system called uh, M-Pesa. Let's look at education. I was in Sweden two weeks ago. I was in Stockholm. 50% of children at the age of six in Stockholm, in Sweden, have access to the internet. Compare a Kenyan rural classroom. They don't have the internet. They don't have broadband. Actually, they don't have water. They don't have toilets. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to tell me how you think this child, this child, this child here, would compete with that child. For Kenya to become globally competitive, that has to be addressed. This is the library that the child has. This room contains all of the knowledge that they have access to. Of course, they have a teacher as well. But you know what? The teacher was educated using the same library as this one. So we asked ourselves, what can we do about that? We have, uh, <laughs> between this time yesterday and today, about 8,000 Kenyans have connected to the internet for the very first time in their lives. You remember what it was like when you did that. 
Do you remember the, the world that it opened for you? Um, the government of Kenya has committed to provide uh, computer access, whether it's laptops or computer labs, to primary school children. We have committed to give free Wi-Fi access to all of those children. Layered on top of that, we've used the Safaricom network to build what we call the Safaricom Blackboard. Blackboard. So we digitize content, and we have that access uh, made available to, to the child. We've also worked with partners to provide revision aids, which can be delivered on the simplest of mobile, mobile phones. Here's a picture of my daughter. She is six years old, and she is educated in England. And she has to compete with the other child. We believe that by running our business with a purpose, we will help the child on the left to compete with the child on the right. Unfortunately, the child on the right will never thank me for doing that when she, uh, when she grows up, because the competition is going to be a little bit stiffer. In, um, in Kenya, we have some health challenges. The, this is what happens when you arrive on the flight an hour ago and that you didn't get a chance to rehearse the slides. Um, Sorry, this, this, I, the reason why I dropped this slide in here, actually, is because this school's opened last weekend. This is the first time that these children, in a, a, a place called Pakot, the first time they would ever have been in a classroom with, with bricks and with, with, a, with a roof. Usually, they sit under a mango tree. Let us look at the issue of um, maternal mortality rate. In Kenya, the maternal mortality rate is... 360 out of every 100,000 live births. How does that compare to Switzerland? In Switzerland, it is 8 out of 100,000 live births. The doctor-patient ratio is 1 to 17,000. Again, I checked it out uh, on the internet, and in Switzerland, it is 1 to, 2000, to 280. That's a huge challenge for any government to deal with, let alone a government in a developing, a developing country. Let us look at children. Out of every thousand children that are born, 49 of them will fail to reach their first birthday, and 73 of them will fail to reach that magical age of five. In Switzerland, only four of them will die. So we asked ourselves, here's a picture of a pregnant woman. This woman is being rushed. Rushed is an interesting word to use in this context. She's being rushed because she is in late stage pregnancy. She has just developed complications. And the nearest facility, the nearest rudimentary healthcare facility, is probably about 20 kilometers away. So where is she rushing to? Why is she in the wheelbarrow? Well, because her family doesn't have a car. There is no ambulance in the community. This is the only way to get her there. And so where is she heading? Ladies and gentlemen, she is heading to that statistic that I talked about a moment ago, which is called death in childbirth. So we asked ourselves, what can we do about it? We have worked with partners to develop a, uh, a simple app on an Android, based on an Android system, which does some very simple things. The first thing, it helps a community healthcare worker who can be a volunteer to track the progress of a uh, pregnant woman. It helps them to register that pregnant woman. For the first time in the history of Kenya, it, is, it helps the government of Kenya to have visibility of the, uh, of, of the mother. Furthermore, we have automated the thing called a mother and child handbook, which uh, the mother is supposed to keep for the first five years of the, uh, the child's life and monitor its immunization. I think we have the same thing here in, uh, in Europe. But of course, you've seen some of the earlier pictures and you see the condition under which they live. And of course, the, the, the booklet will not last five years. And so we can help to track them. We can help the mother to get um, information about her pregnancy. We can help her to understand when it is she needs to go to seek help. We can get her to remember to immunize the child. Um, and we can give her alerts using a very simple, uh, a very simple black and white mobile phone. 
Of course, healthcare is not just about accessibility, it's also about affordability. So we have worked with other partners to develop a low-cost insurance using M-Pesa, and um, that allows a customer, it allows a patient to pay their premium from as little as 12 US cents a time whenever they can afford it. Because the challenge that we have is irregular incomes. Um, and that will give them in and outpatient insurance. It gives them dental care, something which is unheard of in an African environment, in a rural African environment. It gives them eye care and it gives them loss of income insurance because if you're poor, and you're sick, you actually rather continue to work because if you don't, there is no money coming in. These guys are some of my favorite in Kenya. They're called Juokali workers. Juokali workers, Juokali means working in the hot sun. And my team put this picture together and I said, this doesn't show like they're working in the hot sun. So we did another picture. And um, what they're doing is they're actually making a metal sculpture here. They work, um, it's not just hot sun, it's scorching sun. They work from dawn until dusk. Uh, this guy, these guys are probably earning about a uh, equivalent of about a dollar a day, doing whatever it is they do. And they make furniture, and they make uh, 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 metal sculptures. They do lots of stuff. If you went to one of these gentlemen, you say, what's the plan? What's your pension plan? He look at you like you've just taken leave of your senses. Because he gets paid irregularly. He doesn't know whether he'll get paid today or not. And actually, he doesn't really earn enough. And he doesn't know what a pension plan is. So what is the plan? The plan is that he will work until he dies. There is no other option. So we have worked with partners to develop a low-cost pension plan, which again allows him to save from as little as 12 cents a time. And we remind him, using his mobile phone, that you need to pay your premium as and when. And so it allows him to live a life of dignity when he, gets, when he gets older. Water is an interesting thing. The World Health Organization reckons that you need, we all need about 20 liters a day. In the United States, the average American taking a five minute shower uses more water than an African living in a slum. We have some statistics here, which shows that <laughs> against the 20 liters a day, in the US, the average American uses between 200 and 400 liters a day. Here in Europe, it's a little less than that. Um, I don't know whether that reflects how clean we are or not. Um, I say we because I'm partly European. Um, but what, is, what happens in, uh, in Kenya? You know, roughly 50% of Kenyans don't have access to this precious commodity. The United Nations stated that water, access to clean water and sanitation is a basic human right. 50% of Kenyans are deprived of that basic human right. The absence of water and sanitation leads to the death of children. Now, I don't know how many people would hazard a guess of how many. It is the equivalent of a jumbo, a jumbo jet crashing full of children every four hours. That's the challenge that we have with water. Now, how do we get water in Kenya? For 50% of the population, they don't have running water. And this is how they get water. How do they then transport it to home? This is how they transport it to home. You notice that this guy, actually it's not a guy, it's a woman. It's always a woman. She has to fetch, that's a 20 liter container, which is enough for her. The average Kenyan family is about 4.4 which means she has to fetch about 100 liters a day. And she doesn't fetch it from a few meters. She fetches it, she can fetch it for as far as 20, 20 kilometers. I've flown in from Kenya this morning, and that flight is about 6,000 kilometers. That means she walks with 20 liters of water from Kenya to Zurich and back, and then she comes back just for fun. But she doesn't do it on her own. She does it with her daughter. What does that mean? That means the daughter does not get an education. Because, of course, girls are not worth as much as boys. When she doesn't get an education, you know what that means. It means she will die in poverty. She will be subjected to childhood pregnancy and all that that entails, childhood marriages. 
Now, we have worked, you know, we asked ourselves, what can we do about that? We've used this thing called M-Pesa that everybody talks about moving money from one place to the next. We work with Grimfoss, a Danish pump company, to develop a system which allows people to buy tokens using M-Pesa. They then use the token, you can see them doing it here, use the token to dispense water. Now, many of you who come to Africa, or indeed Asia, you know, you'd go to the community and you'd see the plight that they live in, and we all feel the same thing. I remember going to Africa the first time. And so maybe you come back home and you donate a pump. Within three months of donating the pump, it will stop working because nobody knows how to make this thing work. And when it breaks, it will sit in a little rust. That's bad news. So what does, what does this do? It takes the M-Pesa money. It pays for the pump, so this is not a gift. It pays for the pump, and once the pump is paid for, the money then stays in the community to help to uplift the community. Um, you notice, ladies and gentlemen, that I keep talking about partnerships. Now, on the subject of water, in 2011, the Horn of Africa suffered one of its, uh, its most devastating droughts. And I went to a place called Tukana, and this is what I saw. Actually, I took this photograph. I insisted they put it in because I thought that it, um, I hope it captures the desperation that I felt when I, when I was there. And so we asked ourselves, what can we do about that? And I just want to show you a short video. In <laughs> Thank you. Kenya has a population of 43 million people. It generates about 1,700 megawatts. California has a population of 38, and it generates 70,000 uh, megawatts. Um, even if you have the grid go past your house at a reasonable distance, the cost of connection to the, the Kenya power grid is about $400. This is in a country where the average salary is $750 a year. Compare that with California. California, the average salary is around $60,000 a year. The result of that is that 80% of Kenyan households do not have access to grid electricity. Sometimes they do have access to electricity, but it's not grid, and it's going to kill them. They therefore have to use kerosene. Kerosene costs about $7 a week. Plus, you will have to spend about a dollar to transport it from the kerosene station to your home. Occasionally, your, your house or your hut will catch fire and you'll die as a result of that. So we said, what can we do about that? Well, again, we worked with another partner. We worked with a company called Mcopa, a very small partner, to develop a product called Mcopa Solar. And what does this do? Well, it's very simple, actually. It's some uh, solar panels, it's some LED lights, Incidentally, it also has a, a socket for charging your mobile phone. And um, the problem with this product, it costs about $200 to buy. Now, remember I said that the average salary is about $750 a year. A rural Kenyan can't afford to buy this up front. And so we plug M-Pesa into it, and we allow the, uh, the customer to pay 40 shillings. Actually, it's 50 shillings a day. And it's 50 shillings a day because the government has recently... Uh, imposed VAT on the product, whilst they don't impose VAT on kerosene. But that's a different story. So for 50 shillings a day, that is less than the price of kerosene. This woman, Mrs. Otieno, now saves money because it is less than the $7. She has healthier lungs, so she's breathing healthier air in her room. The eyesight of the family is improved because she has better quality light. She reduces the chance of the house catching fire. It is much better for the environment. And the most important thing for me is it helps the child to do their homework. Because the average child, the average kid gets home, the boy goes and he fetches water or he herds the goat, and the girls, sorry, the boy fetches firewood, the girl fetches water. Um, so now they get home, they've done that stuff, it's dark. How are they going to do their homework? How are they going to with the famous child that I showed you earlier, my six-year-old daughter. 
for me, the most important thing about this product is that it helps the child to do his homework. So far, we have done 10,000 uh, of these products, and it is only limited by supply, not by demand. Agriculture is important for Kenya. It accounts for about 25% of the country's GDP. The problem is that these farmers are largely small scale. They buy cheap seeds, they are susceptible to the, the vagaries of the weather, and sometimes, and usually every second year, we have a severe drought which hits the country. They don't have access to quality seeds, they don't have access to best agricultural practice, and importantly, they don't have access to best market prices. They take whatever the market gives them. So we have worked with a few partners. One of them is iCow, which helps them to get best practice. And iCow is, is the first um, digital cow diary, but now it's, it extends beyond cows and now covers chickens as well. Uh, and farmers will tell you, these small-scale farmers, and a small-scale farmer, um, you see one here. It could mean they have three cows. That's a farmer. And they're reporting between 30 and 100% improvement on yield. We're helping to create a commodity market which helps them to get the best prices. Now, we haven't by any means really exhausted this area of agricultural improvement, but it's a start. Kenya is well known for its uh, sporting endeavors. And a few weeks ago, the London Marathon, we were proud. You notice that I've suddenly become a we and no longer become a European. We were proud to have won first and second, both for the men and the women. And it's something as a nation we're very proud of. Some of us who are foolish enough, because Safaricom, we sponsor a marathon um, up at 6,000 feet above sea level, running through a, 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 a wildlife reserve called the Lewa Marathon. And I was foolish enough to agree to run the half marathon. I don't know why, because these guys really run very fast. Now, um, whilst we're proud about them, there's another bunch of athletes and sportsmen that are ignored. And so a couple of years ago, some of them came to see me and said, Bob, um, everybody is focused on the Olympians, but nobody cares about us because we're disabled and because we're deaf. And I couldn't understand why it is that because you're deaf, you couldn't run fast. And so I said, okay, we'll sponsor you, and we'll give you the same prize money that, the, that we gave to the Olympians. And um, rather disappointingly, they came back with more medals than I expected them to, and stripped me of 17 million shillings. And here we have, um, <laughs> we have a couple of gentlemen who came back with not just medals, but also with world records. But then we asked ourselves, what about other Kenyans who are not being given the opportunity? Now, this is a commercial sponsorship. There's nothing special here. We asked ourselves, what about other Kenyans who, are, who don't have the opportunity but are disadvantaged through disability? So there let me give you this. There are 75,000 people suffering from spinal injuries in Kenya, but there's not one proper rehabilitation center to treat them. The nearest one is in South Africa, 4,000 kilometers away. It's a journey most Kenyan paraplegics just can't afford. To highlight this problem, we sent a paraplegic on a journey from Kenya to South Africa. His name, Zach. His mission, to raise money for a rehabilitation center in Kenya. Shot in the back in 2004, Zach undertook this 4,000 kilometer journey in his wheelchair on the premise that he'd stop and return only when we raised the money needed to build the center. We then asked people to donate so Zach could come back home. Hence the campaign, Bring Zach Back Home. On June 9, 2012, Zach left Nairobi. TV, print, and radio ads were created to raise awareness. A GPS-enabled smartphone allowed people to track his journey on the campaign website at all times. He also posted regular updates in social media. The Bring Zach Back Home campaign caught the attention of both local and international media. It also inspired and moved a whole nation. Thousands followed Zach's journey on social media and the campaign website. They turned up in greater numbers to greet him wherever he went. Schools closed for him. Even the Prime Minister's wife came to cheer for him. Thanks to the overwhelming support, close to one million US dollars was raised even before he reached the border. And Zach returned home. But Zach's journey 
did more than raise money for a rehabilitation center in a continent which doesn't care about the disabled. It managed to draw attention to their plight. You have to have some kind of sick mind to think that the way to do this is to put the guy in a wheelchair and send him. Of course, we never really intended he should go all the way to South Africa, uh, but it did raise awareness. And he was, um, is uh, a tremendous, a tremendous guy, and he actually volunteered to do this, and it made a big difference. So there are some of you who are stand sitting in the audience here, or maybe watching it streamed, and thinking, so what about all the fluffy stuff? Here is this African guy um, who's talking about all this philanthropy. Uh, what about the shareholders? Remember I said that we have all those stakeholders that we think about. What about the shareholders? Well, we put together some stuff which you might understand. Um, on Monday, I'm announcing the full year results. Uh, but if I give you last year's full year results, uh, our profits were up 47%. And at the half year, it was up 45%. Uh, two years ago, the company was worth about $1.6 billion. Last year, it was worth about $2.7 billion. And this time, it's worth about $6 billion. Uh, our view is that we are delivering a reasonable degree of superior shareholder return. What about the other metrics? We, uh, we have about 68% customer market share. That translates to more than 80% of revenue market share. We carry more than 95% of all the uh, short message services, the text messages or SMSs that are carried in Kenya. Our mobile money uh, system, uh, M-Pesa, uh, has about 98% market share. We have a brand equity, and that, that's equivalent to uh, roughly 27 to 30% of the country's GDP. We have a brand equity of 8 to 6%, and we have an employee, employee engagement index of about 7 to 7%, and that has been growing steadily. Um, why did I show you that? I showed it to you to say that it is not about purpose or profit. It is through purpose that profit comes. Now, I'm going to conclude. We talked about some stuff, but I didn't talk about what we're doing on climate change and how we're driving that agenda in Kenya. Climate change is one of the most significant issues facing us as a world. How many corporates really, really deep down inside believe that they need to do something about it? I didn't talk about children's rights or what I call the meek and the weak. I was speaking with Stephen Sacker on the, the, the route here, and he was saying that his son, I hope you don't mind me saying that, Stephen, wherever you are, um, you know, his son is currently working in, um, in Kenya uh, with street children. None of us care about street children. I can see the Swiss ambassador to Kenya in front of me, and he wouldn't mind me saying that we turn our faces away when we see a street child because we can't deal with it. I didn't talk about the work that we're doing in that space. I am passionate about it. I'm absolutely passionate about the rights of the child, not just ensuring that you know, when I look down my supply chain, look down or up my supply chain, there's no child labor, so I'm good. I care deeply that the United Nations agreed to the rights of the child, the Convention for the Rights of the Child, way back, I think it was 1979, but we still don't care about them. I didn't talk about diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion in a Kenyan context, it's, uh, it's more than just gender. It's about disability, and we saw Zach just now. It's about ethnicity. Um, I didn't talk about ethics and corruption, something that many, many businessmen, particularly in an African context, and it roused me more than anything else, many businessmen shy away from talking, and I didn't talk about how we're driving that agenda in a, uh, in a Kenyan context. I want to leave you with this. Close your eyes for a minute and enter my world. My name is Susan and I am visually impaired. At first, I didn't know what was happening to me. I could see some light, but when I looked at something, 
All I saw were shadows. I was scared. So scared. It felt like my world was changing. And it was. After several visits to the eye doctor and many special glasses after, they could not help me. I felt helpless, confused, and cried a lot. It took me one year to accept my condition. Since then, I have had to adapt to a world not designed for me. Open Your Eyes Kenya is an initiative supported by Safarico, aimed at empowering over 300,000 Kenyans who are visually impaired. I have now learned to do many things on my own, and I'm still discovering many more. I have learned to make my bed and clean my room. And most of all, walk alone without anybody's help, using my hands, feet, and sense of hearing. I like my new school as it has given me the opportunity to learn so many things that I never thought I would because they care for people like us. Informed by the relationship between Safaricom Foundation and Enable in supporting Thika School for the Blind, we sought to give every Kenyan, including Susan, an opportunity to accomplish their dreams. Becoming visually impaired is not the end of my life. My world has been opened up in this school by learning how to use a computer. When I want to research on something I have learned in class using library books, it takes such a long time to go through every word. But now with a computer, my research has become easy. Visually impaired people in other countries like the United States can surf on the internet on all their websites. And that opens up a whole new world of possibilities for them. I want that for myself. This ideal drove the re-engineering of our online world, making it accessible to the visually impaired. We are inviting you to connect with Susan's story, learn from her challenges, and share her journey in opening Kenyan's eyes to her reality. I used to feel bad that other children could do some things that I could not do. But now I know that's not true. Each day I'm making progress and one day I'll be on the finish line. Please share this video and help me and others like me move closer to our dreams. Together, we can empower Susan and others like her to move closer to their dreams. The more we share this video, the more we open Kenya's eyes. So some of you who remained awake uh, through the last few minutes would have concluded that a few things. One of you might have said that some of you might have said there's no relationship between profits and the purpose that, uh, that you talk about. And some of you may have said that you can only afford to do the purpose because of the profits. So let me then just give you um, one last quote. And it's from Ralph Waldo Emerson. The purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful. It is to be honorable, 
to be compassionate, and to have it make some difference that you have lived and that you have lived well. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if we could have the lights, please. Robert, you not only in helped that girl open her eyes, but I think you've helped every one of us in this room this morning open our eyes as well. That was such an inspirational speech, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We're now going to open it up for Q&A. We have a short time. Uh, very enthusiastic one at the front here. <laughs> yeah. There's a lady here. And is there another person who wants to put their hand up? A lady right at the back. So a lady here first, and then in the back row. Hi, I'm Joyce Meng from New York City. First, thank you so much. It was incredibly inspiring. I think about C.K. Prahalad's book, Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, and there's a clear market of opportunity since the poor pay more for basic goods and services. But I also just wanted to ask, if you're working with such a vulnerable population, how much profit is too much profit from the poor? And if you think about a fair distribution of the economic profit of a good, or a margin ceiling or anything that could have fair distribution between the company and also the, the, the customers. And also, when a social enterprise like yours has the opportunity to scale and to list on public exchanges and raise capital, do you think that the inherent conflict between short-term shareholder profit maximization and stakeholder welfare means that it's actually better just being private and growing the business there with more flexibility, especially since you know, you've been very successful, but we've seen the cautionary tales of SKS and also Compartamos. Thank you. Can I just say congratulations on three questions? <laughs> <laughs> that was terrific. Robert. Oh, so, I, mean, I, I can give you a very short answer. I, I think um, in the past, the, the, the CEOs um, and corporate leadership challenge has been about like standing on a uh, a seesaw, it's one or the other. Uh, today, it's a bit more like standing on a ball. Uh, and it's not easy, but it is like standing on a ball because I remember I talked about our eight stakeholders and you know, corporate leaders need to define how many they have and you have to keep balancing between all of those. I can't give you a number about what profit, how much profit is enough profit. I have to keep my shareholders uh, engaged because otherwise they'll take their money and they'll go. But I have to make sure that the other stakeholders' interests are also considered. Lady at the back. Hello, um, I'm Kelly from Singapore. My, um, I really appreciate what you've been doing, and I, my question is actually, have you ever been accused of using development stories to advance publicity as a means for your company to you know, use, use these stories as a, as a way to gain publicity that you otherwise wouldn't have had? And if so, what would you say to that? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. We have from time to time um, are accused of doing that. Uh, but often we say, actually, if we just took the money that we, we spend, and you know, what I talked about here wasn't so much about philanthropy. Much of the stuff is, is trying to hit a commercial balance. So the um, Copa product is a commercial product. Uh, but we, I often say to people, if I just took all that money back and just put it into advertising, I'd probably get more bang for my bucks. So, but I don't worry about that. You know, for those Christians in the room, will. No, the, the biblical, um, biblical quote which says, let your light so shine, because we believe that we have, let your light so shine before men, before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Actually, whether you're Christian or not, the fact remains the same. If you can set, if you can lead by example, then many others. And you know, I can see in the audience my good friend Linus, uh, Linus Gutai from Nation Media Group, who is, um, is also Kenyan. And you know, Linus is as guilty of doing good and being accused <laughs> of, um, as, as, as we are. But Great. yes, it's a, it's a criticism you get from time to time. A gentleman here. Hello, my name is Siak Uza, and I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa. And you know, it's interesting times we find ourselves in Africa. It's, it's, you know, it's shifting from certainly being a continent, a sponsored continent, to being one, a continent of rapid development, where we see that you know, in a few years we'll have the youngest um, population, working population. So my question is, you know, at this critical point in Africa, what are, what are the, your expectations of, of my generations um, for, for Africa in terms of issues such as inequality? Because it's clear that young people are going to be the voice for change in Africa. 
My expectation is you take your seat. Um, because if you leave it to my generation, you don't have a future because we're nearly dead. And if you don't stand up and take leadership, uh, and you, you know, I, when I talk about my generation, I'm very honest about my generation. My generation is the corrupt generation, uh, and I'm looking at Linus sitting back there, who's also from my generation. Um, <laughs> but you know, we have grown up in an age of corruption and greed and not thinking about the future. And if you don't take that position, it is, it, you're not a leader of the future. You're a leader of today. And I have such great admiration for the 20 something year olds and the 30 something year olds who are standing for political leadership. Don't wait for us to sort it out for you. Thank you. I, a gentleman here, but I feel I must give, Linus has been quoted <laughs> twice. I feel I must give Linus the opportunity to either make a statement or ask a question. And I have to say, Bob, if you think you're already dead at your age, I feel I believe in resurrection. <laughs> so the gentleman here, and then Mr. Linus, because of his stature. Um, Daniel Hager, I would have a question with, with regards to your daughter, because uh, she's studying in the UK. Uh, what is your aspiration for her? Um, because is she really going to compete in Kenya with the Kenyans? Or is she going to stay in the UK and uh, stay in Europe in, in another world? My aspirations for her is that she will have choice when she grows up. Uh, many, the, the child on the other side, don't have a lot of choice. All I want to give her is choice, and then she can make her decision. Whether she wants to be a ballet dancer or a corporate leader, it's up to her. I want to just make sure I give her the opportunities to be able to exercise choice. Okay, my master. Uh, first of all, clearly Bob wasn't here yesterday because he said our generation is nearly dead. Yesterday, we actually had a presentation where we are going to live for another 200 years. Oh, yes, I heard yeah. about that. Uh, <laughs> so we are no, not really dead. That. We are not really dead. <laughs> but just to say that Bob has been actually, actually been very, very modest. Safaricom is a company that has really transformed lives in Kenya. The MPESA initiative is something that is totally, totally revolutionary. It has brought even banking. I didn't think he even talked about the banking bit to people who are probably never going to have a bank account in their lives. So, um, yeah, and he's also my biggest customer. So I have also, <laughs> I, I have also to mind what I say. But uh, it's been, uh, SafariCon's been really transformational and um, yeah, congratulations, Bob. Thank you. Oh, and also the bit about, uh, sorry, the bit about the young people, I completely agree that young people must take up their position and I think if you look at um, uh, countries that are evolving fastest, and yesterday we had the uh, minister from Serbia, uh, countries that are also giving space and allowing the young people to take their position. Because the reality is that they have a bigger stake in the long term. And uh, as we evolve in our lives, we begin to start looking more and more short term because of the, the space between uh, all the space that is left in our lives if the Californian gentleman uh, will not be briefed. But I think it is important that the young people take their place. And Kenya is making steady progress in many areas in actually doing that and giving the young people space to, to, to self-actualize themselves. Uh, in fact, one of the initiatives that we run in the company, and we have uh, partnered once or twice with Bob, is something we call the next big thing. And the next big thing is an initiative where we get young people uh, out there to bring in the ideas, and we get people like Safaricom and other owners of capital to support those ideas, either through coaching or through mentoring, through joint ventures, etc., etc. So I think there is, and I said that yesterday in my breakout, that for Africa or for Kenya, it's actually not a clash of generations. For, for, for our part of the world, it's an awakening of a generation. And this generation is awakening to the potential that is actually uh, so present in our part of the world. And I think for us, the challenge is for the young people to grab it and run with it. Thank you. Have a couple of rides. Is there, 
thank you, Bob. Um, I'm Kerry Eaton. I'm also from Nairobi. Um, and great to have your, your comments and, and certainly second uh, Linus Gitta, his comments as well. I think some people in the audience might have interpreted your presentation as a potential criticism of the Kenyan government, which is why, why is the Kenyan government not doing this? Why is the largest company on the Nairobi Stock Exchange doing that? And, and obviously, you, you know, you've got 17, 18 million customers and, and you reach directly to them. But to what degree are you using your power to get the Kenyan government to also address some of these issues? Um, you know, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, people often look to government to find solutions, um, but the go when we say, who is the government? The government is us. It's, it's you and I and, uh, and other citizens. It's, it's their, their taxes. Um, now, remember I said that $750 is the average salary. The taxation which can come from $750 will not be able to deal with the challenges. And if the corporate world does not step up, um, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm a big advocate of the corporate world stepping up and taking its responsibility seriously, then we will not have, and this, later this afternoon, I think we have a session on sustainability, we will not have a world in which to operate. And so by no means this is a criticism of the Kenya government. The Kenya government is actually a big shareholder of ours and a big customer and a big regulator. So we have a very interesting relationship. But I, I do believe that we must all work side by side with our governments in order to address those issues. We can't leave it up to them to do it. Can I just ask a question myself, Bob, following on from that? Uh, Axel Weber said in the previous uh, panel that we had here, he said that they served, I think, 50% of the world's billionaires. And he said there was an increasing market for a financial product where people weren't looking at the same rate of return as they might expect in the private sector, they were looking for a positive rate of return. Do you find that that market exists and they are the people who, some of them at least, want to come and help you? Absolutely. Uh, my very good friend, um, Jacqueline Novogratz, uh, who heads up Acumen, uh, you know, she can't find enough projects. And she was in, um, in our region uh, last week in Ethiopia having the biggest chicken farm. So the work that people like the Acumen Foundation and you know, they get their funds from those billionaires. Um, so you know, the, 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 the supply side is there. Mm. It is you know, how do we marshal it mm. and how do we get it connected to the demand side. Mm. Let's have another one or two questions. There's a gentleman there, a lady, I'm sorry. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> That's all right, thank you. Um, um, you mentioned sustainability and that segues nicely into my concern and question, which is, um, your uh, market cap is 27% of Kenya's GDP, which is unsustainable or from a macroeconomic standpoint is not good for the Kenyan economy in the long run, obviously, because you would want more companies also to come up and the private sector to develop, right? And um, so my question is, um, when you say profit with a purpose, I'm sure right now in everything you're doing, it is helping the private sector to emerge and more players in the economy to come up. But as you look into the future, um, how do you, how will, how, what's your thinking on balancing um, protecting your market share with um, helping other private sector players to emerge as well? Sometimes I seem to be spending more time out of the country than in the country. Um, certainly that's what my partner might say at home. Uh, and that is because I spend a lot of time actually selling Kenya as, a, as an investment destination. There's no shortage of demand for Safaricom shares. Um, on a typical day, demand will exceed supply maybe by 10 to 1. Uh, but I want to encourage more people. And you know, I said in answer to a question earlier, is let your light so shine. What I want to show people is you can run a very successful business in an environment like East Africa, uh, and, and deliver very good returns. The reason why I put the numbers up is only because I, you know, I think some of you would, would probably say, well, he's just talking about philanthropy. And I wanted to point out that actually we are delivering a good set of results. Um, if you had given me uh, you know, $1.60 uh, two years ago, I would be giving you back $6 today. And so I want to show people that come and invest, not necessarily in my company, invest in you know, Nation Media Group, invest in a whole range of other companies there, come and start your own companies. And if you can all do that, and you do it with a purpose, 
and not let it be extractive. Unfortunately for Africa, much of the investment has been very extractive investment. So you put your money in and you, you take it back out. So dividends are, uh, uh, are sent home and things like that. You know, that has to change. I don't know if I answered your question adequately, but that was the best I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Lady here in the front of the third row. Hi, Martha here. A question to, um, with regards to your role in the UN and the UN Global Compact. Um, you say profit through purpose, yes. Um, don't you think some companies may need uh, some, some help along the way? Uh, yes. the, the UN Global Compact, the 10 principles, uh, by some may seem a bit fluffy. Um, and there have been a lot of debate whether to make them binding and introduce some kind of accountability mechanism. What will be your role going forward with the UN Global Compact? I, I think this is a very good question. Um, I, um, I, I'm probably leaning on the side of making it a little bit more compulsory. If you look at sustainability reporting in places like uh, South Africa, it's high, but that's only because King 3 says that you have to report. Um, and so people start to report. And once you start to report, then you can start to deal with the issues. Because it is voluntary, we find there's actually quite a high rate of churn. Um, so cost, um, companies sign up. After a couple of years, they stop reporting, and then they fall away. I think that it should be a little bit more, a little bit harder than that. And I think investors need to start to ask the hard questions. Unfortunately, uh, you know, as I travel around Manhattan, sometimes I'm doing investor roadshows and doing UN Global Compact, and investors, large investors, will say to me, "What's the UN Global Compact?" And you know, you have to ask yourself if you're going to give the money to somebody to manage, how are they managing it? Are they abusing labor rights? Are they abusing human rights? Are they operating ethically? One of the things that we said when we picked shareholders, well, obviously shareholders is an important stakeholder, we didn't have to pick them, they're already there. We said, what are we going to do for them? We didn't say we'll give them superior shareholder returns. We said we'll give them professional management, transparency in how we, how we manage their money. And I think investors need to be asking that question as well. And we those of you who are not signed up to the UN Global Compact, you should. Could we have one last question? Right at the back, there's somebody waving. Maybe it's because they want fresh air, but <laughs> I don't. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, getting a lot of fresh insights. So I'm Pranjal Sharma from India. A uh, very interesting question, uh, which you've raised, uh, Bob, and thank you for the presentation. CSR, or Corporate Social Responsibility, another phrase for profits and purpose has been made mandatory in my country. Where, you know, 2% of net profit has to be now invested, uh, if I may, into such projects. What's your view on this? Should, should it be mandatory or should it be voluntary? It's kind of tough. Um, it's, it's kind of tough, that one. I think, you know, when you make things mandatory, and I come back to the UN Global Compact question here, when you make it mandatory, um, of course, the, the money will flow, but you want to change, you want to change it here rather than in the wallet. And, and you, you know, this is the reason why I said, and when we were debating what would we call this, uh, this session, and I said, profit with our purpose. Um, you need people to understand that actually, if you can make a difference to the community and the society in which you live, your company will prosper. You cannot run a company where you have, uh, you know, 45% of children involved in child labor one way or the other. You cannot be happy about running that company. And so I, I'm a little bit torn. I don't know whether you should make it compulsory or not. At least if you make it compulsory, the money will flow. Uh, but I think we should be focused much more on changing the mindset. And coming back to the question from the young man who I think is gone now, um, you know, what is the role of young people? It is up to you guys to start to define that, define that agenda. Because I know that you think differently to the generations which went before you. Can I say, say three things uh, in conclusion? First of all, Bob, you're a godsend to a chairman because you keep your answers brief. And that's no mean achievement, I can assure you. Secondly, I, by background, I was 20 years an academic uh, and a social scientist. And we talk about the capitalist economy or the market economy or a free enterprise system. But at the heart, of what we believe in and what the Schmidt Heine Foundation is really financing is, I think, a human person. It's the entrepreneur. And I can honestly say I've met many entrepreneurs in my life. Invariably, they've loved their product, they're passionate about their business, 
but they've also sensed a greater responsibility. And I found enormous generosity among successful entrepreneurs. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, that I think is the system which we are defending. And it's so easily put into ideology without realizing at the heart of it there is actually the human person. And thirdly, uh, I welcomed you yesterday to the conference and actually quoted uh, from Edmund Burke about the nature of the social contract in which we are part, the living, uh, those to be born, but also the dead, our heritage. And I think uh, over the last uh, day and a half or so, uh, what's really excited me about the choice the students made, the clash of generations, clash suggests an adversarial relationship, but if we talk about the challenge of generations, then I think what's come out to me is that actually without a challenge of generations, we would be living in some sort of feudal, stable economy. Whereas what a challenge to generate, a generational challenge implies there's life, there's progress, experimentation, innovation. And I think what's come out to me in this conference is the amazing, we're living in still a huge technological revolution Globalization is by no means finished. The potential is just so exciting. And what you told us this morning of what you are doing, that to me is the kind of capitalism I can raise my hand and say, I really believe in that. And I think that's what St. Gallen is about. I think that's what the Max Schmidt Heine lecture is about. And I think you've been an outstanding lecturer. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, it's really got people excited. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you.